morning. Welcome to Central Baptist Church Online. I'm Ken Adams, and I want to wish you a, a happy Mother's Day. I'm sorry that we can't meet together, but we can still have a happy Mother's Day. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about the heart of the mother of the Messiah. A teacher had just given her young students a lesson on magnets, and it's time for the quiz. So one of the questions read, my name starts with M, has six letters, and I pick things up. Half the class answered, mother. <laughs> Mothering is tough. She's all the time having to say things like, close the refrigerator, pick up your socks, turn off that video game, do your homework. And kids think their mothers nag them just for sport. But actually, mothers are training their kids for the day they get married. How else are they going to learn how to nag their spouse? But not all kids need to be reminded very often. Maybe there are some that never need to be reminded. Have you ever thought about all the things Mary did not have to nag Jesus about? If Jesus were to leave the front door open, Mary never would have said to him, What? Were you born in a barn? If Jesus was involved in any problem, she knew the other kid in the family was lying. So crash, Mary runs into the living room and she looks down on the floor and there is her favorite vase in a million pieces. And she asks Jesus and Joseph Jr., uh, who broke the vase? And they both point to the other and say, he did. Mary's response was, Joseph, you're grounded. Still, raising the Messiah could not be easy. It was both perplexing and painful. Today's text points that out. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 19. Now there were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the angels, that the shepherds, said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary pondered all these things. So what are these things that she pondered? Well, clearly she pondered the visit by the angels. This is the third time that Mary has been associated with angels in a short period of time. Gabriel appeared to her and said, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. When Joseph was about to divorce Mary, it took an angel to come to Joseph and say, Mary has been faithful to you. Her child is of the Holy Spirit. And now the angels have come and have appeared to the shepherds, and they are announcing that Jesus indeed is the Messiah. And it's good news. But you know, babies are always good news. It's good news for everybody when a baby is born, whether they know it or not. Now, I say whether they know it or not, because yesterday, statistically speaking, 
there were 360,000 babies born in the world. But I don't know the name of any of them. I don't know any of them. And they actually have no personal effect on me as far as I know. But they do have an effect on me, and they have an effect on you. Jesus was good news for everyone throughout all time. The Jews had been waiting for a long time for a Messiah. God hadn't spoken to the nation in 400 years, and the Gentiles, they knew the idols they were worshiping were made up. They were just doing it to keep out of trouble with the state. And the state knew that they weren't real either. It was all a sham. It was just a way to keep order. They were weary, though, for something else. And Mary birthed a healthy baby boy. Can you imagine what it was like? Of course you can. If you're a mother, you've done this. You count all the toes and make sure they're all there. And you count all the fingers. And you look into his eyes to make sure he can see well. And, and then you, you tickle him and you hold him and you cuddle him. And smooth out whatever hair he has. And Jesus probably had a head full of black curly hair. What did Mary ponder? Well, this visit from the angels, this little baby who was the Messiah. And she knew the baby was the Messiah, not just because God had sent an angel to tell her, but also because prophecy had proved it. Look at chapter 2 and verse 11 again. For there is, this is, this is the angel talking, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. There's two prophecies fulfilled here. Number one, the Savior, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, Judea. And second, this prophecy, or this baby, would be, according to prophecy, God incarnate. Signs confirmed it. Chapter 2 and verse 12. This will be a sign to you, or the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, it's no big sign that the babe is wrapped in swaddling clothes. Everybody's wrapped in swaddling clothes when they're born, and they're wrapped in swaddling clothes when they die. Little strips of, of linen that would wrap around them like a mummy. I'm not sure all the reasons why they would be wrapped in swaddling clothes as a baby. Something to do with they thought it kept them well, it did keep him from moving. They thought that was beneficial to his health. But he was wrapped in swaddling. No big deal. All kids are wrapped in swaddling clothes in those days. But here is the sign that he would be lying in a manger. Not many children would be lying in a manger, a feed trough that was for an animal. This would be a sign. And this was proof to the shepherds that this was the Messiah. So prophecy proved it, and signs confirmed it, and heaven celebrated it. Luke chapter 2 and verse 13, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angels were celebrating the birth of the Messiah that they had waited many years for. Mary pondered these things in her heart. She pondered the news that the shepherds brought. The angels appeared to the shepherds, and the shepherds visited the holy family. Because the angels, well, they were trustworthy. I mean, if you saw something like that, uh, it would be hard not to believe it. And so they trusted the angel's story and they wanted to be a part of this event. That's literally what Luke chapter 2 and verse 15 says. It says in English, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass. But literally it says, let us now go to Bethlehem and be part of this thing. Part of this thing. So many things that you want to be part of. I do remember when I was a teenager that a girl that I worked with 
bought concert tickets to see to see a, a musical group, and her mother said, "Why would you spend your money on that when it costs much more than buying an album? When you can buy an album and you can listen to it over and over again." And she said to her mom, "Well, it's not quite the same, and it's not quite the same, is it? To be somewhere is different than to look at it from the outside." Just like it's, it's different being in church than it is listening to me preach to you from your couch. It, there's just something about being there. And the shepherd said, we want to be part of this thing. And boy, they were part of this thing, weren't they? For all of history, we've been talking about these shepherds who came to, uh, to the manger and then spread out and told everybody they could about it. Now, can you imagine how Mary felt? When these shepherds came to uh, this little barn and said, Angels appeared to us and told us your son is the Messiah. Why, wow, he's famous. He is the most important person who has ever been born. Mothers are proud of the achievements of their children. That's why they put bumper stickers on the back of their cars and, and license plates on the front. My son is an honor student at so and so school. That's why parents go to band concerts and plays and graduations when it's just the first grade. All these things, they want to be part of the life of their child. They are proud of their child. They are proud when others recognize the achievement of their child. Shepherds spread the news and they said the Messiah is born. They said the angels told us, and everyone who heard it, the Bible says, everyone was amazed. This is the beginning of Jesus amazing everyone. Jesus amazed everyone all of his life. When he was 12 years old, you remember he got lost. He didn't get lost. His parents went home and he stayed at the temple. He was talking with the scholars at the temple. And because he had such a great grasp of the scriptures, they were amazed. When Jesus preached his first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth, his neighbors were amazed. When the crowd watched Jesus as he healed the paralytic from his bed and said, take up your bed walk, the crowds were amazed. People that encountered Jesus were amazed. And Mary was amazed that people were amazed at Jesus. Mary, just a little kid. In our culture, she would just be a little kid. She was a simple teenager, 12, 13, 14 years old. And she was from a small town, not very sophisticated, probably hadn't traveled more than 30 miles from her hometown in any time of her life. All these angels and all this fuss from strangers was overwhelming. But Mary would spend her life pondering, as mothers all ponder their children's lives. Mother's rocking the child. She's just two or three days old, and she's wondering, who is she going to marry? Will she get married? Where is she going to go to college? Will she go to college? What kind of work will she do when she gets old? How long will her hair grow? I wonder if she'll have long fingers or short fingers. These are the things that mothers think about when they're rocking their children. How will my child change? This is such an amazing gift from God. And oh, oh, how will I ever raise him? I don't know how to raise this child. There's, no one gave me an instruction book. Mary pondered. Mothers pondered. But what does it mean to ponder? Ponder is more than a, a fleeting thought. But pondering is when you stay there with a thought. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. There's really two words here that tell us about how she pondered. 
The first word is kept. I believe in some versions that's treasured. It means to preserve. It means to store it away. Thus the word treasure. We get the idea of a, of a treasure chest, a cedar chest that, that women used to have at one time to prepare for their wedding. These are things that, the, these thoughts, she put them away for safe. Many mothers store memories of their children. When our children were young, it was popular still to have baby books. And you would write down all these events that happened in their life up to a certain age. You'd cut out their, you'd cut a lock of their hair and you'd, you'd tape it to a, pay, a piece of paper. And all kinds of things were in it. And we had photos. And we still have photos. They're just on our phones now. And now we have videos. I remember thinking that when, when finally we have grandkids, I'm going to go out, and I was pretty young when I thought this, when finally we have grandkids, I'm going to buy a video camera. <laughs> Don't need a video camera anymore. It's in my pocket right now. But, but parents now take videos of their children, and some parents store old boxes of toys. Old boxes of toys. I got in our attic one time and there was a box of stuffed animals that my wife had saved from our children. They're not good for anything. They've gone through dry rot, but she stored them. Mary stored these thoughts. She kept them in her heart. And she pondered them. To ponder means to think seriously about. The Greek word is very interesting. It means literally to throw around. To throw around, yeah, the idea is you have this thought and you're throwing it around in your head. And you're thinking about it from different angles, different perspectives. And you look at this and from this direction and this direction. Mary pondered these things in her heart. Children, you, you, you kids would be amazed at how much your mother ponders you, thinks about you. And you go out with your friends and it might be that you're just at their house in the afternoon. And she's thinking, I, I wonder what room of the house he's in now. I wonder if, if he's okay. I hope he's having a good time. Mothers think about their children. And throughout her life, Mary would pull these thoughts out of her heart and think about them. Some of the memories and some of the wishes and some of the things that had not yet taken place. Like you might pull an old photo album out or on your phone and start sweeping through the thousand pictures you have of your kid. And he won she wondered. Is Jesus going to be a celebrity? Is Jesus going to be rich? Is he going to be poor? She pondered these things and she wondered, wonder if any more angels will appear to me or to Jesus. I wonder if my friends are finally going to believe me when I tell them one more time that I was a virgin when I became with child. <laughs> Mary pondered. It was incessant as all mothers pondering is, but it wasn't only over happy things. And Mary also pained. She pained over a bittersweet prophecy. We read of it in Luke chapter 2 and verse 22. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. That is, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. According to the law, as you just heard, women were supposed to come to the temple on two occasions after they had given birth. 
On the 31st day after the birth, they were to bring the child to the temple and dedicate him to the Lord. And there was a practice called redeeming where they, they dedicated the child to the Lord and they paid some money to buy him back from the Lord so they could raise him. And then on the 41st day, they were to make a simple sacrifice. And you saw the two things that they offered when they were poor. Mary, in the 31st day of Jesus' life, was already a good mother. Now, we still do this nowadays, sometimes. Parents will bring their children to church when they are babies, and they will ask the pastor to dedicate that child to the Lord. And that is a wonderful thing. I encourage you to do that when you have children. Mary did it. Mary did it, though, because she was obeying God's law. Now, there's no law for us to do that today, but it is a good thing, a good way to start your child's life out. She brought her son to God's house, as all good mothers do, bringing their children to God's house, which, of course, today is the church. But while she was visiting, she heard a prophecy, and some of it was a bit disturbing. She heard this prophecy from a prophet by the name of Simeon, who's mentioned in verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So here was a very, very good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit, which is good. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, which means he was waiting for the Messiah. Now, why was he waiting for the Messiah? Because, verse 26 says, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Well, here comes the Lord's Christ in the form of Jesus from Nazareth. And so God had promised this, and now it's coming to pass. And he recognized Jesus as the Messiah, verse 27. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. This is all good. The Messiah has finally come. The Messiah that the Gentiles had hoped for. The Messiah that the, the Jews believed would come by prophecy. It's all good. Well, uh, not, not all good. Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and verse 35, there is a cryptic prediction. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What does this mean? Well, that's a good question. What does this mean? Many will fall. I'm guessing that it means that many will reject this Messiah and thus fall, that is, remain lost. But many will rise. And I'm guessing that means that many will accept Jesus as their Messiah and they will be saved. But here's the really personally sad part for Mary. A sword will pierce your soul. Motherhood has many, many joys, but motherhood is pierced by pain. Mary's suffering will be more than any other person. More than any other person's. The prophecy, of course, was fulfilled. 
Then he did rise, and, and salvation came, and they rose to meet this salvation. But at what cost this salvation? When Mary is pondering Jesus as the Messiah, I wonder what she thought. Did she think Jesus will ascend a throne? Jesus will wear a crown? We are going to move to a palace. Jesus is the Messiah. Or did she anticipate that it might not be that way? Could she have understood? Could she have imagined that that crown of throne would not be a crown of throne, a, a, a crown of gold, but would be a crown of thorns? Did Mary imagine adoring crowds bowing down to the king of the Jews? Well, Jesus had adoring crowds. I don't know that they bowed to him. But they turned on him and cried, crucify him. The prophecy would be fulfilled. Jesus does save. And in the end, Jesus rose from the dead. And in the end, many were saved. And today, many are still being saved from sin, from eternal death, from a life of, of indecision, and sinfulness. You know, we hear a lot about how bad things are. How bad the world is getting and how Christians are being persecuted. But, but hold on to this figure, okay? Hold on to this figure. There are 65 million new Christians every year. Now, Christianity may be on the decline in our country, but it's on the rise in other countries. 65 million. That is 178,082 per day. 178,000 new Christians every day. All because 2,000 years ago, a teenage girl gave birth to the Messiah. It is really hard, I imagine. Be a mother. Now, I'm not a mother. My mother was a mother. She was my mother. My wife is a mother. And you know, you never say they were not. They were a mother. Because once you're a mother, you're always a mother. And you're always pondering your child's life. But it's hard to be a mother. Sleepless nights beside the sick bed of a feverish child. Anxious days preparing for your little girl to go to the prom. Worried weeks when they go off to college. Are they going to get in trouble? Are they going to fail? Are they going to be able to find all their classes? But it's a joy to be a mother too. The smile of your student when he makes the honor roll. The shriek of delight when she announces, I've fallen in love. He asked me to marry. And the soft, cuddly baby that's now your first grandbaby. Motherhood is sweet and sour. Surprises and sorrows. It is a commitment the world is grateful for. And I am grateful to every one of you that has taken on this task of being a mother. Thank you. May God bless you. Father, we thank you for mothers that we have known. Some close and some not. I pray this morning that you will fill them full of all they need to be good mothers. We ask that you would help them to know how to direct their children to be saved through Jesus Christ. It's his name we pray.